Thank you very much. Um, thanks, uh, everybody, for being here. Um, well, my name is Elias Nino. I'm coming from the Applied Math and Computer Science Laboratory, uh, Department for Computer Science, Universidad del Norte, in Colombia. And today I'm going to talk about efficient implementation of, of ensemble-based methods in sequential data simulation, a code for localization. So basically what we have, right, we want to estimate the state of a system which approximately evolves according to some imperfect numerical model, where here uh, lowercase n denotes the number of components from the model state. You can think in the resolution of the model or the size of the vector state. Usually it's very huge. Uh, this model mimics the behavior of the atmosphere or the ocean, for instance, and it takes a state in a current time and it propagates to some uh, time in the future. We have also noise observations which with, uh, relates vector states to uh, observation space through uh, observational operator. Uh, here, lowercase n will be the number of observations. I'm assuming it's large, but we can also have a sparse observational network. And we also also a prior estimate xb, which is coming from typically from a numerical model, and we assume that the errors of xb follows a normal distribution centered mean and covariance matrix b, which is well known as the background error covariance matrix. So basically we have the state of a system, we have in this case a linear observation operator, I have observations from the actual state of the system, I have a prior estimate of the state of the system, so the question is whether I can get a better estimation than the prior one given by the numerical model, and we know the answer is yes, okay? So basically by Bayes' theorem, we know that the posterior probability is given by the prior times the likelihood. If we assume that both are Gaussian, then the posterior, uh, estimate the posterior mode um, can be obtained through this uh, maximization of the posterior probability, okay? So it can be easy to show that the posterior mode is given by one, um, but any of these equations, all of them are equivalent through matrix identity, the Huguri matrix identity, for instance. Here, A is the posterior covariance matrix, and D is the innovation vector. Since prior and likelihood function, both of them are Gaussian, then the posterior distribution is Gaussian as well with these moments here. So the question is how do we estimate XB and B in order to perform the assimilation of observations? Well, we can make use of an ensemble of model realizations, right? So where each column of this matrix is an ensemble member and capital N will be the ensemble size or the number of model realizations. Then we make use of the empirical moments of the sample in order to estimate the moments of the background error distribution. So in this case, in this case, the sample mean will approximate or will be our estimator of the background state, while the ensemble covariance matrix will be our estimate of the background error covariance matrix. Here, delta x will be the matrix of member deviations, nothing but subtracting the ensemble mean for, uh, from each ensemble member. Then let's look at uh, a very simple example. You know this numerical model, the Lorentz 96. Is, it has been widely discussed in this um, workshop, this symposium, sorry. So typically we assume that a lowercase n is equal to 40, the number of model components. Each model component stands for a particle which fluctuates in the atmosphere. And this model exhibits chaotic behavior when the external force, force is set to uh, 8. Okay. So it's very interesting, right? So if we, for instance, focus on the uh, black line and then we add some perturbations on each component, we'll see that those perturbations uh, quit very fast because the model is extremely chaotic. And that's why it makes, uh, that's make this model attractive for testing emerging data simulation schemes. Here the plots are the variables. Some of the variables I choose uh, six variables from the Frody and I show you the how the evolution in time, okay? Now, if I make use of 10 to the 5 ensemble members, this is the structure of the background error covariance matrix, my estimate, and this is the SORF, okay? As you can see, well, it, it makes sense in the sense that the implicit, um, the implicit boundary, uh, cyclic boundary conditions here 
make uh, the appearance of these correlations uh, on the corners, okay? Well, now this is estimation via uh, 10 to the 5 members. Now, uh, how do we compute samples from the posterior distribution? Well, there are many ways. One of them is by the stochastic ensemble common filter, uh, in which I have three different ways to do that, right? So uh, again, all these uh, formulations are equivalent through matrix identities. I missed a minus one here. Here, the PA is our estimate of the posterior covariance matrix. Delta Y will be the innovation matrix on the synthetic obs uh, observations. And here, YS is nothing but a synthetic observation, which basically we perturb the unique observation that we have in order to obtain those. Uh, we know that this can induce some sampling noise, but it makes the filter statistically consistent, okay? And here, uh, E is just, um, is uh, the nose ensemble member, and we assume that the noise that we add to the unique observation is given by, uh, or, or is coming from a normal distribution with uh, zero as mean and data error covariance matrix R. Well, based on this, right, for instance, if I observe all the observations or all the uh, components from the vector state or only 50, well, I get some behavior, okay? I get some behavior. But the issue is that we are using here too many samples. In practice, we know it's prohibitive to have such ensemble size. But isn't, there is no issue, right? We can just reduce the number of samples and we will see something like this. And basically what is going on here is, among other things, is that spurious correlation are impacting the quality of the analysis innovations, okay? And then how do we correct that? Well, we can make use of, um, well, this is how the covariance matrix looks like when we make use only of 10 ensemble members, you can see it's very noisy and very peaky, and we have a bunch of spurious correlations in that covariance matrix, okay? Then, uh, we can make use of all localization methods. We know that they can help us to counteract the effects of sampling noise. And there are three different flavors. We have covariance matrix localization, special domain localization, observation localization. I mean, all of them have been proven to work very good in practice. Um, um, for instance, special domain localization is very common in the context of ensemble square root filters. Uh, observation localization is similar uh, in somehow. Well, basically, what it does is that we step it at each observation and we update model components. And covariance matrix localization, what we do is that we enforce the structure in the uh, covariance matrix by using some uh, covariance happening, right? So we multiply component-wise with some desired structure, and then that reflects in the resulting estimator. But now I'm going to talk about precision localization. And what I'm going to talk about this because basically I want to exploit what is in blue here. When two model components, on, when the error of two model components are conditionally independent given a radius of influence and the other components, their corresponded entry in the precision covariance matrix is equal to zero. And that's very important because it means, for instance, if I consider a radius of influence equal to zero, I will get that precision covariance matrix of, of the inverse background error covariance matrix, my estimator will be diagonal, for instance. If I assume the radius of influence is one, then at most, per row, I will have nine components different from zero. If I assume the radius of influence three, then at most, it will be 49 components different from zero. And that's very important because remember that the size of the background recovery matrix is huge because it depends on the model resolution. Um, it says the model of model components. How do we do that? Well, basically we support in the bikela levine estimator the modified Chalecki decomposition, okay? Where basically we can obtain estimators of the precision covariance matrix at the background, the inverse background error covariance matrix at the product of three, ma three matrices. Uh, this is T is a lower triangular matrix. So basically it gets something like T transpose D inverse T. The components of uh, T comes from fitting model of this form, okay, where basically XI is the i-th row of the matrix of member deviations. And the components of uh, D, D is a di diagonal matrix, and it will hold the variances of the residuals at each diagonal entry, okay? Now, 
what this means, well, basically I'm saying that for each model component, I'm just considering the predecessors of that model component for a given radius of influence. The predecessor is as follows. If I want to compute, for instance, the predecessor of model component six, first, the neighborhood given a radius of influence one is what you are seeing here, is all what is in blue, right? But the predecessor will depend on the label that we put or we add or how we label the components of the model. In this case, for instance, I'm using row measured ordering. So if this is a square, this is one, two, three, four. I continue here, five, six, seven, and so on, right? All, can also make use of column major ordering. And well, we can make use of any ordering which exploits the special structure of the mesh that we are using, for instance, okay? So in this case, the predecessor will be all those components whose label is lesser than the one of interest, in this case, the number six. In this way, we ensure that the covariance, major, the T factor is lower triangular, okay? It's lower triangular. So, this is my PV, the sample covariance matrix. I'm assuming, for instance, a radius of influence of three here. You can see that the structure of T is lower triangular. It's very sparse because whatever is outside the scope of the radius of influence is zero in my, in my factor. V is a diagonal matrix. When I multiply everything, the structure of my estimator looks like this. This is the resulting V inverse. And this is the resulting estimator V. And you can see it looks like a localized covariance matrix. But I never localize directly the covariance matrix. What I do is that I impose a band structure in the inverse covariance matrix. Okay? Then when I make use of this precision matrix, well, I get things like this, right? And of course, I, we can improve the results by making use, for instance, inflation. I really don't care right now about inflation. But yeah, we know it's important. But this, my experiment focuses in just the estimation of the precision co uh, uh, covariance matches, okay? Another manner to estimate very robust covariance matches in the sense of the, or, or, or the case of interest where we have very huge vector states and just a few samples coming from the numerical model is by using, uh, well, sorry. Uh, first, I want to, because I don't want to, to lose the thing here. We have an estimator who, uh, which looks like this, right? We have B inverse. And the point is how we can efficiently solve this, where there are many ways. I'm going to show you just, just one of them. For instance, if we consider that the posterior ensemble is given by the prior, this matrix times H transpose R inverse and delta Y, which is the innovation, the synthetic uh, observations. So basically, we decompose this R in, in two square roots here, we let z equal to h transpose r uh, minus one half, and then we can write this expression as a bunch of uh, sum of rank one matrices. Okay. Then by having this way, what we do is that we consider a sequence of matrices of this way, where a naught is equal to b to the minus one, which is given by the Cholecki factor that we just estimate, and we start adding round one matrices to this, which we expect to have the form of a Cholecki decomposition. So we start adding all of them all the way through uh, the number of observations m. Once we have this, we will have an, an estimate of the posterior, of the inverse of the posterior covariance matrix. So we have an estimate of the precision analysis covariance matrix in the form of Cholesky factors, which is very important because it will be our, our life easier in the moment that we want to compute the posterior ensemble, okay? Now, how we do compute the intermediate uh, Cholesky factor? Well, yeah, at, in it, at any intermediate step, step, we have something like this, right? And then the idea is to decompose these matrices as these factors here. This will be lower triangular, this as well, with the same structure that we have imposed before, and therefore we preserve the structure in this multiplication, and the multiplication of these two will give me the Tj transpose in this case, and Tj here, okay? Now I can write Aj as Tj transpose Dj, Tj. Now, the proper way to decomp uh, in order to avoid this decomposition, I mean, I don't want like to build this matrix and then add to this and then decompose it, what we do is that we make use of a Dolittle method, okay? 
And by using the Lorentz method, it can be easily derive this set of equations here, okay? Where I start by the position and n of the matrix D, and then I'm going all the way through the first position or the first model component. In that way, I can, as you can see, I have n, n operations to do. I have j, j depends on the number of observations, so I have n times m, but at each value of i and j, I consider only the predecessors. So it means that the computational effort of computing the, these factors of the posterior covariance matrix, the inverse of the posterior covariance matrix, is bounded linearly in the number of observations and the dimension of the model state. So I'm not increasing the computational effort of the semi common filter. Okay? Well, at the end, just xA is equal to xB plus Q. Q is, is, uh, is very simple to compute. It's, uh, lo uh, this is uh, upper triangular, diagonal, lower triangular. We don't need to invert anything. Just make use of some forward and um, backward substitution in order to compute the uh, posterior uh, members, okay? Another way, as I said before, is to make use of shrinking covariance matrix estimation where basically what we do is that we, if we have sample from this distribution, we assume that our matrix have the next structure. It's gamma times uh, target matrix plus one minus gamma, the sample covariance matrix, okay? Now the optimal value of gamma is usually computed in a square law sense, the expectations of the norm, Frobenius norm of our estimate of the estimate and the actual covariance matches, okay? Some properties of these estimators have been proven more accurate than the sample covariance matrix. Better condition than the true or the actual covariance matrix, and they are just drawn under the condition uh, lowercase n much greater than n, which is actually our case, okay? Two estimators are found in this context the gamma of the Ledoyan wolf and the gamma of the Crow Blackwell Ledoyan wolf estimator. It is proven that under Gaussian assumptions, the RBLW estimator provides a lesser uh, exp um, minimum error in an expectation sense, okay? So basically, in a square law sense, this is much better than the Ledoyan wolf estimator. So, we can just think that if I have no prior information, I will use my target matrix as the trace of PB divided by N, okay? And then I have the gamma values, and then I just plug in everything and I can obtain my estimator. But the issue is that the target implementation is prohibitive, right? Because the dimension of the model state is very huge, it's very large. We need to look for an alternative, right, in order to compute the components mu and the component gamma. We need to recall that the trace of PV is equal to the sum of the singular values. However, PV is run deficient, and at most it will have n minus one singular values different from zero. And this is true because since PV is symmetric and positive definite, the eigenvalues and the singular values are the same, okay? Same story for this. I just apply whatever is here to the eigenvalues or singular values and are the square here. And again, since we have at most n minus one different from zero, I don't need to compute anything just bounded by n minus one. Now this implies something, right? PB is equal to this uh, matrix of anomalies times the matrix of anomalies transposed. If we compute an economic singular value decomposition of this matrix, we result with something like this, right? This is well known. Now, this allows us to know that a singular value of PB is equal to uh, the square of a singular value of the matrix of member deviation. So actually, you don't need to compute PB in order to know his singular values. I can support in the, rank, in the low rank approximation or low rank square root approximation of that matrix, okay? Now the estimator of reason this way, where mu B, B hot is equal to this, and gamma is equal to this. As you can see, I'm not computing any trace of any matrix. I'm just computing an economic singular value of a, of a rectangular matrix, the matrix of member deviations, okay? And the computation is bounded by the ensemble size, and therefore is not in somehow 
computationally expensive. Okay? Now, if we incorporate this and make some simplifications in the ensemble context, we end up with the ensemble common filter, Rao Blackwell, Edoian Wallace estimator, which is half this form. As you can see, there is no covariance matrix explicit, uh, or it doesn't have any explicit representation of the background error covariance matrix. Okay, it's implicit there. And CV is computed by the solution of this linear system, which can be efficiently solved by an iterative ensemble common filter. It's a, um, an iterative Sherman Morrison formula, it's, 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 it's in the literature, so you can exploit the special structure in order to, to obtain that, okay? Now, let, let's see some very simple, some toy experiment making use of the speedy model. So we make use of Fortran 90 in order to code the Yankee FMC, also the RBLW. I'm going to call it shrink a covariance from here. 96 ensemble members, initial perturbation of the background state is 5%. The model is propagated for a period of 24 days. Observations are taken every two days. The speed model is used with the T63 resolution. It gives us a total number of model components of 590,000 um, components. Three experts observational networks were used for the test, and we compared the results with the LTKF. Okay, so this is the three observational networks. 12%, 6%, and 4% of components observed from the model state. I want to, uh, the, the results I'm going to show, I'm not showing for uh, rise of influence equal to one and two. For those rates of influence, the LTKF and the compared methods behave exactly. They, they look very similar. However, when I increase the size of the radius of influence and I decrease, for instance, the observed components, I can see that the LTKF is impact. I know that you know, one can argue that if I make use of inflation, yes, I can improve the result of the TKF. But uh, what, I do, uh, what I did here is I just set the inflation factor to 1.04 for everything, okay? For the LTKF and also for, for uh, the estimation. Now, the point here is that also when we increase the radius of influence, the local box is, is bigger, right? And then the local box is bigger means that we have more components. And since I'm, I fix 96 ensemble members, maybe the number of components inside the local box is, is bigger than the number of uh, samples, and therefore the resulting covariance matrix, which in the context of LTKF is implicitly the sample covariance matrix, is implicit by the sample noise, okay? So as you, as you can see, the very first assimilation cycle here, uh, this is the reference solution, this is the background, this is the modified Chalecki implementations, and this is the LTKF. LTKF is able to uh, dissipate the spurious waves here near the poles. However, the magnitudes of the variables are quite different, okay? The same for the sonal wind component U. And here I'm showing you how a local estimation of this V inverse looks for the speedy model. I have, in this case, four variables. This is how T looks like. This is the resulting structure of V inverse. This is V the inverse of B inverse, and this is how the structure looks for the four variables, okay? Also, we can compare with the shrink and covariance matrix, the RBLW, similar results. And also something very important here is how these methods can be easily uh, implemented in parallel uh, scenarios, right? So I make use of the Blue Ridge supercomputer at Virginia Tech. Um, uh, the methods are called in Fortran. I'm using MPI, and I use LAPAC and BLAST in order to speed up the computations. And we vary the number of processors from 96, 16 computing nodes, to 2,048, 128 uh, computing nodes, okay? So what we do is that we, the approximations are based on domain decomposition, so I split the domain. Also, I preserve information for, uh, uh, from the boundaries. So I send the different uh, uh, subdomain to different processors with information of the boundary, okay? And then for instance, when I make use of uh, six to 128 computing nodes, this is the maximum number of processors will be 2048 and this will be uh, 96. So something that is expected is, well, yeah, it's not behaving well here. I know I can make use of inflation. I can make use of a smaller radius of influence, that's fine. Uh, since the LTKF is a deterministic filter, I don't see any variations. 
I have small variations in the ENKFMC because I'm not able to reproduce the same uh, random noise for the synthetic data at the different processors for different, um, for different uh, splitting of the domain. So in this, for instance, in this case, I've split the domain 6, 16, 30, 32, 48 times the number of processors. So I'm not able like, to replicate the experiment, but you can see that difference are just quite because, are, are very small just because, because I'm not able to replicate the, the sampling noise for the synthetic data, okay? Same for sonar and wheel component. Here we can see for the RBLW. Again, the, the LTKF should not change. It's not sensitive because we don't make use of any synthetic data. I have a small variation in the RBLW because, because of the synthetic data at the different location, different processors. Okay. And this is how things, right? So the LTK is much, much, much faster than the other two methods. This time, this is in seconds. This, uh, this is the number of computer nodes. So as I increase the number of computer nodes, well, we can see that effectively the computer, uh, the time they can, taken for the simulation process decreases, right? We, it's something that we expect. Um, for the maximum number, the SC and C approximations are, are very similar, okay? So here, uh, the MC um, is computing the Science Journal of Scientific Computing. You can find there all the theory and also the statistical theory behind the approximation. And the parallel approximation is uh, implement is showing the Journal of Computational Science of Elsevier, while uh, the NKFSC is uh, publishing the cluster computing, the parallel implementation, and also an application to uh, economic impact wind correlation in the electric power system research Elsevier. And you can find the theory, I mean, not the, not the parallel, in the Ocean Dynamics Journal of Springer. So all, all but very deeply details are, are showing all those uh, publications, okay? So thank you very much. <laughs>